Are you tired of overpaying for your gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and bars? Then visit sdbullion.com today. SD Bullion was recently named the 177th fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Magazine. This is because they offer the absolute lowest prices in the industry and follow up with over the top customer service. So what are you waiting for? Go to sdbullion.com today. Enjoy more than 60,000 happy investors that save money on every precious metals purchase they make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and with us today for our SD Metals and Markets Wrap is our co-host Eric Dubin and our guest today is Jason Burak. Jason and Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks Elijah. Great to be here. All right, now I'd first like to discuss uh, the precious metal markets because this week, um, I guess if we wanted to start with Jason's perspective on the price action in the precious metal markets, it seems like we're pretty much flat for the week, if not a little bit down. Yeah, and and I think there's there's a divergence here that's been going on for a while now. I, I I've been calling I've been thinking about this more the last couple of weeks, calling it manipulation arbitrage. So I don't know if this is all uh, central banks manipulating paper precious metals prices, or if it's uh, the bullion banks combined with maybe uh, private sector Chinese uh, speculating. But there's been uh, in the past there was a very positive correlation between copper and silver and that correlation for a while now has seemed to be uh the positive correlation has seemed to be getting less and less where copper uh had very very strong rallies for a while and silver was not moving up so it's it's very frustrating for me and you know the bullion banks and the central banks who who have the stake in manipulating precious metal prices they have they may have an incentive to do this but if you think about it from a manipulation perspective and maybe they're just uh this is an effect of china uh, stockpiling copper but uh, really, if you can keep the copper price high, there's a lot of silver byproduct uh, that is available, a lot of extra supply. And if you look at the fundamentals of the primary silver miners, they're not doing very well. Uh, last month was the Denver Gold Forum, which is uh, one of the best conferences there is for your listeners out there who want to research how the industry is doing. And uh, First Majestic Silver, which is one of the lowest cost primary silver producers in the world, you know, they've been having problems the last couple quarters continuing to cut costs. and the more you look at mining companies, I think mining companies cannot perpetually cut costs and maintain high levels of production. Uh, they have been able to do this for the most part uh, during this paper bear market since 2011, but they, you can't do this indefinitely. So I think we're close to hitting a wall with the uh, regard to the the paper metals prices, Elijah. You know, you mentioned they're having problems. You know, every, it seems to me every time gold goes up 30 bucks, you know, uh, when it's about to break out. And it just get, keeps getting knocked back down. The same thing for silver. And, you know, we have these cryptocurrencies which don't have the manipulation that gold and silver do. And these things, you know, just seem to uh, catch a bid. People are buying the dip strong. This is what was happening during the precious metal bull market prior to 2011. And so the mining company shares, if I could get something in before I'll pass the baton to Eric, the mining company shares, I'm looking at the uh, Sprott Junior Gold Miners ETF, which is SGDJ. And since January, it's tried to break out three times and it's been capped uh, three times. So it's kind of in a trading range. Uh, it's trying to make uh, uh, higher lows, but it just can't break out above key levels and it just keeps getting knocked back down. So I think the industry uh, you know, is going to keep on trying to figure out how to tread water. But uh, the, the primary gold miners at this point uh, are in a lot better shape because they have better margins than primary silver miners, at least for a while. But there's still a lot of long-term problems with both industries. So uh, they can't perpetually cut costs. And um, you know, un uh, unless demand for physical metal drops, and we don't see evidence of that, uh, there's there's going to have to be in the next couple of years uh, some res a return to reality where uh, the miners are going to be able to, uh, they need a higher price. So basically 1,400, 1,500 gold and uh, 25 to 30 silver. We're going to have to see this in the next two or three years, I would say, or the industry is just not going to be able to produce at the level uh, levels they are now. Now, turning to you, Eric, do you see the, so basically what Jason is saying, if we don't get 1,400, $1,500 gold, the mining industries are going to be in big trouble. Do you see that happening, you know, in the next couple of years? What is your perspective? 
I think uh, that chain reaction would, in fact, happen, but the prices will move above those levels even in the next couple of years. So uh, the mining industry is going to have its bacon saved. The reality is is that um, you know, it's harder and harder to find high-grade deposits. Costs are going up. Uh, size of deposits are, generally speaking, smaller. And these are trends that have been going on for decades. And uh, we have hit a phenomenon commonly uh, called in, in derisive tones by some peak gold. And that's just where we are. And the same thing is existing with silver and the industrial uses of silver are growing very, very rapidly. When the switch flips in the West, where people are going to be interested in using gold and silver as a safe haven assets, when um, people's perceptions of general assets like the stock market and the bond market turns around and, and, and people are fearful as opposed to being stupid and greedy, <laughs> that's when the alternative assets are going to start screaming higher. And we're going to hit that at some point. But, uh, you know, right now we are in a, in a very manipulated market. The precious metals are, are uh, following uh, expectations of interest rate differentials and the way people perceive what uh, various central banks are going to be doing vis-a-vis -vis their balance sheets and their interest rate policy. And so, you know, right now we're going through this period where people are rushing back into the dollar. We've seen it for a couple of weeks now, and it's just, uh, you know, these are the kind of machinations that go on in these markets, and uh, for the time being, we're getting a lot of pressure in precious metals, but the stock market is going to roll over at some point. You know, the economics and fundamentals are not there to support it, and markets just don't grow to the sky. We've made that point over and over again, ad nauseum, and, and, and it's just the way it is. Uh, the markets are continuing to move higher because we have 150 plus billion dollars worth of liquidity flowing into the markets from central banks every month. And if you, you know, d depending on how you, you calculate stuff and, and which banks you add, you can get up to 300 billion per month. So, you know, the central banks are going to curtail some of this flow next year. They're starting now. They're going to have to stop at some point because the entire financial market edifice that they've built is going to come crashing down if they cut off the spigots. And that's where we are. And we are always frustrated by, you know, looking at how – it's impossible to time these things and, and have the egg on our face as forecasters looking at the object reality that we face, but that's just where we are, and that's the kind of liquidity flows that the Federal Reserve and ECB and all the other banks are pushing into the markets to create this, this alternative reality. It's like the twilight zone. Yeah, and hedge fund managers, to add to Eric, Eric's points there, hedge fund managers are calling this the everything bubble. But in my opinion, I would amend that just a little bit. I would basically say everything but gold and silver and mining shares is is in a bubble and is basically going higher. People are buying the dips on all these things. So we could go, we could just talk about the the major asset classes like the stock market. The Dow the Dow went from twenty two thousand to twenty three thousand in record time. It's almost to twenty four thousand already in even faster record time. And there's not the, – all the Dow companies are not doing well. So it's only a couple companies that are doing well. It's mostly the FANG stocks, Facebook, Am Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, that are doing well and moving the indices up, or Goldman Sachs occasionally. Uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, as we know, because President Trump, uh, three of his main – three or four of his main advisors are Goldman Sachs people. The uh, people who voted for Trump did not vote for Goldman Sachs people, I assure you. And so uh, you know, the other is neocon, uh, neocon marine generals. So uh, when you look at the – to look at the other major stock market indices, indi Index, which is the S&P 500, uh, only about 10% of those companies in the S&P 500 are in uptrend still. 90% of them are in pronounced downtrends. They are not, for multiple quarters in a row, having good revenues, earnings, they're missing, and lowering guidance and not doing well. And yet the indices continue to rise. So maybe, Eric, the this if you're a hedge fund manager out there or, or an aggressive trader, maybe the manipulation trade here, the, the hedge manipulation trade is long the Dow with options, call options, long the S&P 500. And then you go and do your fundamental research and find the laggards, the companies that are actually, you know, totally, uh, totally bombing these things. So then you could take advantage of this central bank and uh, uh, leverage short volatility trade that's being piggybacked on top of the central banker. Uh, interventions, and then you go on uh, the companies that the market recognizes are having bad quarter after bad quarter. You can go and make money there too. But uh, so yeah, the the other uh, asset, major asset classes. Let's just talk about them briefly too. Real estate market, 
uh, Eric has been covering this. The Australian real estate market housing is is god awful. There's been an enormous amount of Chinese money that has leaked into there. There's huge uh, housing and property bubbles in Vancouver and Toronto, uh, also in London. Some of these are starting to break, and in certain cities, Elijah, it's as if the the uh, 2008 finance housing crisis never even happened. The property values are at those levels are higher than they were before that crisis. And then we have a commercial real estate bubble in the United States and many areas too. And the thing that's the scariest, Elijah, and, and central banks, I think the two largest markets they care about the most are currency exchange rates and bonds, uh, besides manipulating interest rates. But that ties in with you know currency exchange rates and the bond market as well. And so uh, the bond market, Elijah, we now have, and talking with bond traders, this is just mind boggling. We have European junk bonds, which a lot of these junk bonds, Elijah, these companies that are raising junk debt will go bankrupt in the near future, next couple of years. So normally the market price in, prices in the uh, risk of bankruptcy, and it's not doing that. And now there's lower yields, which means the market thinks that there's lower risk in European junk bonds because of all that European Central Bank quantitative easing. Uh, their balance sheet is now larger than the Federal Reserve's. So the market now thinks that European junk debt has less risk than certain U.S. treasuries. So we've gone to just ridiculous levels on a lot of these other asset classes. And, you know, gold and silver mine shares have not been the beneficiaries of this. So you, people who are owning this have looked have put a lot of their money into this and not diversified have looked very stupid for a while. But, um, you know, that's what happens w with a lot of markets is, uh, you know, there's just a lot of irrational behavior right now. Now, moving to Eric, um, it's, you know, Jason brought up the idea that there's pretty much everything besides precious metals and precious metal mining shares are in a bubble. Now, some people might say that, well, look at the economy. We saw GDP this third quarter. It was just released that GDP was at a 3% annual rate instead of the expected 2.5%. And some people might say, well, hey, you know, that actually the economy is doing well. So shouldn't the stock market and all, all these other asset classes also be doing well? What is your perspective? Well, I mean, we have you know, some expansion going on, and we see you know trade flows improving, and and you can see blips like in the ISM survey that suggests that you know manufacturing is doing decently and, and whatnot. But the reality is is that the corporate profits that are being generated by our 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 economic activity have been in a funk for many many years now. The underpinnings of the stock market's rise in price is not from earnings; it's from liquidity flow lows and from low interest rates, making it such that uh, easy money flowing into the financial system has enabled prices to rise, and people are kind of on autopilot. There's more monies now flowing into the stock market based on automated trading systems and um, passive-based investing and ETF-based investing, and people are just kind of like going out to lunch and chasing whatever's going up, and so the stock market is considered to be like a parking spot for cash because there's you know there's no way to get uh, any kind of return on one's investment that's safe when it comes to savings accounts or bonds or whatnot the, the, the retirement community is being decimated so yeah. there's nowhere to run other than going into the stocks and that's why stocks keep going up and up and up that's that is the psychological underpinnings of a bubble and that's where we are yeah financial to, add to Eric, Eric's points there about financial repression yeah so people are going into the stock market there will some people if they're desperate for income are willing to pay almost any stock market valuation for any type of dividend yield the other thing is a lot of these uh, brand new hedge fund managers and traders working at investment banks Elijah you know they're only a couple of years older than you they were not around even during the 2008 financial crisis so they don't know what a bear market looks like they haven't survived a bear market so they only see buy the dips it's in an uptrend I mean if if someone gave if if someone uh, if you graduated from a major uh, Ivy League business school you worked at an investment bank for a couple of years and things were in an uptrend, it's easy to make money in a bull market like that. So the old saying, the old Wall Street saying is don't mistake a bull market for brains. We have a lot of that right now. So um, I'm not trying to predict the exact top or exact crash of this, but uh, what Eric said about the real economy is what I would point out is that a lot of the problems in 2008 are even larger than they were in 2008. Nothing was really solved. Everything was papered over with more money and credit, many trillions of dollars in money and credit. And so uh, problems that used to only be uh, 10 billion, 100 billion, 
these problems, Elijah, in the real economy, uh, in credit markets, are now over one trillion in size, and there's a lot of them. Yeah, so and the, let's 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 put on our macroeconomic hat and, and expand this just for our audience's perspective. When what's gone on since the 2008 crash has been that we've had over 10 trillion dollars worth of uh, liquidities pumped into financial systems from central banks and that's created a lot of uh, business activity and economic demand that basically is stealing demand from the future and pulling it into the here and now uh, malinvestments left and right you have for example, the rescuing of the auto industry that happened after the 2008 crash where, you know, the big three in Detroit were going to go poof. And so the cheap money mechanisms uh, saved those companies. And then here we are with an auto inventory that's massive and <laughs> excess bubble in auto finance credit markets to the tune of, you know, more than a trillion bucks going now. We, we have so much demand from the future that has been stolen and stuffed into the here and now to create this illusion of a strong economy. And th that's until when we have uh, the credit mechanisms being pressurized with interest rates moving higher at some point in the future, people are going to be strapped and their, their ability to, to function economically will disappear very, very, very quickly. And that's what will create the, the shift in the business cycle. And that's what the markets will respond to. And that's going to happen sometime within the next year, give or take, because just the duration of this move, second largest or second longest duration move in the stock market in history, economic economic expansion on par with the longest duration as well and it's all based on on liquidity and it's it's vapor <laughs> and or at least you know a major percentage of it is vapor i'm not saying that the entire economic backdrop is artificial that's that would be overstating the case but obviously when you dump up to 300 billion dollars worth of liquidity into world markets every dang month you're going to have a hell of a party and, and to add to Eric's points there, uh, this has been – October 2017 has been the least volatile month in stock – not, not – uh, has been the excuse me has been the least volatile month in stock market history. So normally, if you go in the if you go and look through stock market history in the past, there was a lot of big crashes in October. So you had the October 1929, you know, Black Tuesday. Uh, the Black Tuesday crash that preceded the Great Depression. You have the uh, 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 last week was the 30 year anniversary of uh, what was it? Black Friday, 1987, October 19th, 1987 uh, crash. So that was the 30 year anniversary. That was the last time that central banks didn't do massive hardcore intervention into the markets. And so there was a 22 percent down day in one day, the largest in history. But you know, within I think a couple of weeks, the market had rallied pretty strongly. So uh, this this month, there's been there's been the least amount of volatility on record, and a lot of this, Elijah, and this is something that hedge fund managers are talking about, but the mainstream financial media doesn't want to talk about it because they need to sell stock uh, stock mutual funds and bond mutual funds to the people watching, and their sponsors, you know, are all the financial service companies, the index companies, and the and the uh, large banks that are selling these products is the leveraged short volatility trade, which a uh, hedge fund manager, Christopher Cole, says now is $1.5 trillion in size with leverage. And he has a lot of a lot of research to support this. So basically, there's a, uh, this, uh, the, this trade was piggybacked. This is initially the central banker's intervention or plunge protection teams and exchange stabilization fund. And then so day traders, investment banks, hedge fund managers, uh, financial institutions, they're not using their own money in a lot of cases. A lot of these guys would, uh, when asked, would uh, said they wouldn't put any of their own dollars into this trade because how dangerous it is. But they're picking steam, uh, they're picking pennies off, you know, a freeway during rush hour traffic. And so for basically, since the 2009, they've made money on this trade. There, uh, there was a day trader who just been shorting volatility on the VIX uh, with short straddles and also on the general stock market indices. He's made, he's turned five hundred thousand dollars with leverage into eleven million dollars since uh, two thousand nine. So uh, they're running this guy's story. I just read that read that recently. He was a target manager. I'm sure, he's a smart guy, but you know he's 
if if the this leverage trade if he has too much of this his own money in this trade it, he could blow up and end up owing more more money than he ever made in the first place and so this is the type of um you know things people with the trend traders people are doing these trades on leverage uh and uh this is this is the markets we have now with uh, the the other credit bubble i want to bring attention to your listeners is china uh, Eric mentioned ten trillion dollars. I think he, Eric's being modest. Uh, I, I I I would think the liquidity that central bankers have poured in. We know it's well over eighteen trillion, just from the G four central banks with the Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, European Central Bank, Bank of England. Uh, when you add in China, China has almost a forty trillion U S dollar credit bubble now, and all that money has not stayed in China. Uh, whether you're a Chinese businessman who's corrupt or a uh, corrupt Chinese Communist Party official, you've taken that money and you're speculating with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You've gone and bought real estate in some of those aforementioned places outside of China. You've taken the money out of the country and parked the cash. So, um, you know, it's it's not the, the uh, there's a lot of gold bugs and silver bugs out there that think that China is going to save them. China is uh, a lot of private sector Chinese citizens are buying physical gold. Uh, the People's Bank of China and other sovereign wealth funds in China are buying a lot of physical gold. But China, because they've done so much, uh, I would say, stupid Keynesian central planning, trillions in misallocated resources and all the corruption there that uh, they even if the gold price went to ten thousand uh, dollars, an ounce with all China's gold holdings, they would have a tough time paying back all their debt because they and they have such a large credit bubble there now too. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Jason, was um, the GDP that I mentioned earlier. What do you think is driving this? You know, it it's officially a three percent GDP for this, uh, you know, annually for this last third quarter. So why is it, you know, higher than expected? Okay, so the the GD, GDP statistics are are constantly being tweaked and and rejiggered and the the thing is that these things are always Elijah and this been this way since I've been uh, covering markets and I've learned about uh investing and economics and and a business uh, really since 2007 is these things are always seasonally adjusted later. They're always revised downwards a month or two later. And normally the revisions, Elijah, are enormous. So we don't, th these numbers in general, I have a huge problem with GDP. I don't think it's real, but GDP is made up of government spending, consumer spending, investment and exports. <laughs> And so the U.S. has been getting – Donald Trump has been getting some of these large deals done. Uh, he's been getting a lot of part-time jobs. I don't uh, – add it. I don't think the economy is creating a lot of high-paying full-time jobs. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, when he ran during the election, he said this great rhetoric that you know the Federal Reserve – uh, was manipulating interest interest rates lower. The stock market was a bubble. He was going to fire Janet Yellen. Uh, remember him saying that the jobs and unemployment statistics were fake? Well, now he's saying the opposite. So uh, either either he was totally lying then or he doesn't know what he's talking about now or it's very, very dangerous. Uh, he set himself up, Elijah, to basically be the bag man if, if the global elites and the central bankers do allow a, a huge market crash for six to 12 months. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So I, I don't think the GDP numbers are real. And, um, you know, a lot of these deals with Donald Trump, whether they're the carrier deal that he was praising or the others, if you go back and check on these things that he was praising, you know, as the election was coming around and he had won the election and he was transitioning into the inauguration, a lot of these things never came to fruition. And there was also for a lot of these states, whether it's Foxconn going to Wisconsin or the carrier deal, there was a lot of subsidies needed for the Foxconn deal in Wisconsin. I, I specifically looked at that when I did a short video on, on my channel. Uh, there was over a billion dollars in subsidies that are needed just to get Foxconn to bring mostly an automated factory uh, there. So, yes, there's going to be some human jobs. And they're going to be high paying, but it's not we're, we're not going back to the 1970s and 80s where there's, you know, thousands and thousands of factory workers anymore. A lot of these more modernized factories have a lot of robotics, a lot of automation, and the amount of human beings necessary at the factory are going to be a, a lot lower than in the past. All right. Well, Jason Burak and Eric Dubin, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers, I guess starting with Jason, any last thoughts you had and where can they find you online, Jason? Uh, Wall Street for Mean Street dot com, W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T dot com. Uh, my YouTube channel also has over 3 million views and almost 20,000 subscribers, but because of YouTube censorship, I'm not sure how much more free content I'm going to be putting out. Uh, may only be one a week or so. But uh, yeah, last thoughts is, uh, you know, the dollar, the dollar index is heavily manipulated. There's been huge swings with the dollar and the euro. I wanted to bring that point up. So not only do we have paper price manipulation in gold and silver markets, and there is strong physical demand in China and India and the Russian Central Bank. Uh, demand for physical precious metals in by retail investors in the U.S. and Canada is has basically collapsed. I think a lot a lot of people have liquidated their physical gold, physical silver, and mining shares, and they're chasing either stocks or cryptocurrencies higher. And uh, the the other point uh, I wanted to make is uh, if you're patient, you know, even in these low uh, paper gold and silver prices, there are still winners in gold and silver companies and those are the large royalty and streaming companies so your franco nevadas your royal golds your weed and precious metals your cisco gold royalties and your sandstorm golds these are companies that have good balance sheets that have access to capital uh they won't they won't totally destroy their balance sheet or risk bankruptcy if they do a deal here and so if the manipulators do keep prices at these levels for a little while longer or even lower they will have cash to deploy for great long-term investments. And that's why you see the stocks of companies like Royal Gold and Franco Nevada doing well the last couple of years, despite the paper precious metals prices not doing much. Any last thoughts you'd like to add, Eric? Uh, those are great points, and uh, the managers of companies that are streamer companies actually love these bear market periods because it puts them in a good place to go and scoop up some good assets. Uh, I, the final thought I just toss out is just to let our uh, listening audience know who are not aware that Jason and I periodically do produce a show together called Welcome to Dystopia, and you can catch that at his channel, and you can follow my work above and beyond what I do here by just checking out my Facebook page, and that's facebook.com slash Eric Dubin. All right, once again, Jason and Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.